All Things Connecticut is a CPTV production made possible with support from People's United Bank. With additional support for the power of giving provided by Newman's Own Foundation. People's United Bank has been a part of Connecticut since 1842. We've been successful because you, our friends and neighbors, have supported us from the beginning. We thank you for your loyalty, and we are delighted to renew our support for all things Connecticut on CPTV. The program will bring you a mix of familiar sights and places, as well as some new discoveries. On behalf of your friends at People's United Bank, please enjoy the show. Thank you. Hi, I'm Matt Roberts, and welcome to All Things Connecticut. Today we're in for a wild time here at Wild Bill's Nostalgia Store in Middletown. We'll take a look at some of the really unusual things waiting for us inside this discreetly painted roadside attraction. Coming up later in the show, Christina DeFranco chronicles the resurgence of the oyster industry in Connecticut. Eric Lemon celebrates a new winter tradition in downtown Hartford. And Ed Wurzbicki visits a master guitar maker in Spotlight on the Arts. We'll leave this wacky roadside attraction for a few minutes to meet a group helping people get on the road. Imagine how different your life would be if you didn't have a car. Not just for a few days while it was in the shop, but if you were truly without your own transportation. Many people in Connecticut live with this reality every day. Larice Harvey, a single mom juggling work, college, and family, was one of those people, until she discovered a program created by Lutheran Social Services called Good News Garage. Unlike most other car donation programs out there, or other charities who accept cars, we take the donated cars, we try to repair as many as we can, and then we match them with families in need. Lee Miles here in New Haven is one of the businesses that has partnered with Good News Garage to get their donated vehicles ready for the road. And these guys aren't afraid to get their hands dirty to help those in need. We collect the titles for the vehicle, hold it for uh, administrators of Good News, and then we perform a safety check on every vehicle. Safety is key with Good News Garage, and John's team thoroughly examines each vehicle to make sure it's roadworthy. Well, found the broken vehicle. See that? By mistake. So the headlights are fogged. No big deal. Still okay. We've Still probably okay. safety almost 400 cars. Wow, 79,000 miles. That's great. This is a good car. The cars that make the cut are repaired and then matched with qualified applicants based on their needs. Like Larice, who was able to leave her 90-minute bus commute behind and make a better life for her and her daughter. I was able to go grocery shopping, go to work on time, um, stay late if I wanted to, do some extra volunteer stuff, and finish school. I had a very busy schedule, and it was all in the bus system, and it, I was able to do more because of the car. After driving her Good News Garage car for a number of years, Larice was able to trade it in for an SUV, which she now uses in her work with another nonprofit. She doesn't take her ability to travel for granted. That's crazy. People don't realize the privilege it is, the access you have when you have your own vehicle. And donating an old car to Good News Garage and letting a family have that car, you're talking about cutting time in half what it takes to get up, get kids ready for school, and grocery shopping, easy. In Good News Garage's small East Hartford office, thank you notes from appreciative drivers adorn the walls. And the staff works hard to get donations so that families no longer have to, as one recipient put it, thumb a ride. In Connecticut, since we started in 2002, we have matched more than 500 families with a car. You've got to give it back to your community. I was brought up that way. It's just a great feeling to see somebody happy, you know, and uh, you made their day. That's a great thing to see somebody smile. 
Good News Garage is good news for a family. Your senses are quickly overwhelmed when you walk into Wild Bill's Nostalgia Store because there's just so much to look at. There are fun house mirrors, an enormous collection of posters, a mechanical clown that is one of only two left in the world, the mirror ball from Studio 54, even a rib from a 65-ton whale makes a great gift. And then there's Wild Bill himself. He'll take us on a whirlwind tour, but first we'll go from the mass-produced to the one-of-a-kind with Spotlight on the Arts. Long before his hands begin their labor of love, Joel Danzig dreams up guitars with some definite DNA. It's totally about surrounding myself with inspiration and almost in a subconscious way, building an instrument to a theme. One of the world's finest guitar makers, this thoroughly modern luthier has given birth to some of the most iconic electrics ever, including custom designs for hundreds of artists, like the Beatles, Pearl Jam, the Police, and this five-neck monster for Cheap Tricks, Rick Nielsen. He's not like a standard luthier where he's just a craftsman. And there are those guys that build beautiful instruments and, and know how to play them a little bit, but Joel really knows the music because he started out as a musician. A hopeful musician in hometown Chicago in the early 70s, it was his day job fixing and reselling instruments that pushed his talents and technical skills one big step further. Once you've repaired and restored old guitars, it's just really a hop, skip, and a jump to building one from scratch. Yeah. So in 1973, with Fix-It partner Paul Hamer, their new line of guitars was launched. And as sales for electrics boomed in a pop culture crazed by the British invasion, so did Hamer Guitars and Danzig's career. He took the quality of Gibson and because it was a smaller shop, was able to detail it and make everything perfect. They took Gibson and put it on steroids. In 2010, after a three-decade career, creating his own vintage guitar label became the logical destination. I was fascinated with these older guitars, the ones from the 30s through the 50s, before vintage guitars were really called vintage guitars. They have a soul, they have a story. By the time you get it, that instrument has, has witnessed all kinds of things. Toggle switches, dials, and electrical wiring. It's stuff like this you find tucked away at the local hardware. But to Joel Danzig, it's a little bit like Berry treasure, especially if they've been used before. These are old switches that were in operator switchboards in Chicago. I can use it to control the electronics on the instrument, and it has the old cloth covered wire, so I'll refurbish this. Imagine if you could hear all the conversations that went through this <laughs> switch and all these wires. I'm trying to make a new guitar, but there's a whole prehistory that I build into the guitar. Well, this is inspired by a place in Fort Worth in the 1800s where all the cowboys would go for their, their pleasure. This is uh, maple and ebony checks. And to me, it kind of looks like a lariat. So I want to put this around the entire guitar. Today, in the woods that surround his Connecticut studio, Danzig lets his ideas unfold. With each handmade guitar, he's rekindled that creative idealism once inspired by a single childhood memory. I must have been like 10 years old or something. One of the camp counselors brought an electric guitar and an amplifier to camp. I'd never seen anything like this. It was, it was a guitar, somehow electrical, so it like pushed all the right buttons for me. 
It was music that was as loud as a race car. Everything about it just captured my imagination, and that's when I knew I, I had to be part of that. For Spotlight on the Arts, I'm Edward Spicky. Welcome back to Wild Bill's Nostalgia Store, and I'm here with the man himself, Nostalgia Store. No, this is Wild Bill, of course, and his grandson. And uh, Bill, can you tell us a little bit about the sculptures we're standing near? Yeah, the, the sculptures are made out of animal traps. and We wanted to find a way to make the traps useful, so I gave them to an artist from Buffalo, uh, Chris Hausbeck, and I said, go make me something. So he came up with the trap man back here, then I said, well, we need something else. You didn't use the uh, grizzly bear trap. So he built me a bear. And if you think what's inside is strange, wait until you see what's outside. But first, let's take a look at Treading Lightly. It's a lot of work, and it's not one of those things where uh, it's going to be an easy day, you know, because it's painful. It's farming, but it's underwater. There's no off season for the oyster farmer. A December morning with a nasty northeast wind. No excuse for Jim Marco, who's been growing the prized Noank oyster in the Mystic River for a dozen years. Every year we use the same ground again, clean it off and plant it again. Jim is planting the seed oyster he grows indoors at a facility in Long Island. We use the little estuary areas to grow the seed and then we'll move it out into deeper water after they mature. We have to grow them to a large enough size to protect them from the predators. This two-year growing cycle, the only way that oysters are fighting their way back to this part of Long Island Sound. Back in 1998, a parasite decimated the state's oyster population. The disease is MSX and Dermo wiped out probably 95% of the adult oysters in the Sound. At the time, the state's largest shellfish crop. It's taken a decade to rebuild. We normally plant about 10 million oysters a year here. We started in this area, there were absolutely no oysters. So within about 10 years, we've, we've got a population that's pretty big, and now we see that it's starting to actually reproduce on its own. It's very encouraging, because before Jimmy got there, he couldn't commercially go out there and harvest those oysters and make any money at it. Jim is also growing the industry supplying seed stock to area towns and smaller farmers like Steve Plant. I can sell every oyster I have. If I had twice as many oysters, I could sell twice as many oysters. That's because these so-called boutique oysters are in high demand. So you need 20 bags? 20 will do. OK, all good. I could call Jim, and two hours later, I have oysters. It's a high-quality product. And, you know, we just love promoting local product. They're a very uniform oyster and a good meat quality. Once the liquid does that, you've broken the seal. Now, of course, I couldn't I accept Jim at his okay. word. I had to taste one for and myself. You got it all the way on. Perfect. Perfecto. Really good. Now I know why the Bureau of Aquaculture wants more smaller fishermen to join the ranks and spread the word about this superior oyster. It's basically East Haven to Stonington, there's about 88,000 acres that would be available for new shellfish companies or existing ones to lease. So we feel there's going to be a lot of growth. Carrie's proposed legislation to make the permitting process go much quicker. What we'd like to do is when someone comes in the door and wants to do this, we get them into business, you know, in 60 days. And a bonus, oysters also cleanse the sound. We have a business that makes a profit that the product of it takes nitrogen out of the water. It is satisfying, and I know that, you know, the more we do it, the more it'll help the environment. Okay, Thank enjoy you. them. Yep, take care. For Treading Lightly, I'm Christina DeFranco.
Wild Bill has had an affinity for clowns big and small ever since learning that his grandfather performed as a clown with Barnum and Bailey. And clowns don't get any bigger than what you're about to see. Behold, the world's largest jack-in-the-box. Bill converted this silo into an enormous version of the child's toy with just a little hint of creepy. So, Bill, what is the story with this thing? Well, the head belonged to Bob Keeshan, who was Captain Kangaroo and Clarabelle the Clown uh, in TV land in the early days. It runs on a 600-pound uh, counterweight, the ball of death. Did I mention it's difficult to miss this place from the road? And now, let's take a look at Eric Clemens on Inside Out. For two years now, people have come out to Bushnell Park and enjoyed a chance to skate in a winter wonderland. On weekends, it's the kids' turn. Children ages 5 to 12 come out for skating lessons, which often pose a challenge, but most of the time result in kids jumping at the opportunity to have some fun. Everyone's scared of falling at first, but then after they fall once, they're okay right after that, because they realize it's not that bad. Here we go. Hi, guys. Swizzles. What we try to teach here is the very basics so that you will have something the rest of your life. That if invited is, as a high school student, a college student, an adult, that you can go out and be social on the ice. Okay, so the program wasn't necessarily created to discover the next U.S. Olympic figure skating champ. We're going to march. But to date, more than 37,000 have come out to the park to glide on the ice. And there's more incentive if you want to give it a try. The skating here at Bushnell Park is absolutely free of charge and continues through President's Day. And the entire community is playing a part here. Many of the helmets you see worn by the youngsters today have been donated by Connecticut's Children's Hospital. One, two, three, go, go skating! skating! And the knit hats have been made to keep them warm by RSVP, a local senior citizens group. Even the skates are covered here. All sizes have been donated and a pair will be loaned to you if you don't have your own. One of the major players whose efforts have helped keep this expensive hobby free is former Hartford Whaler Bob Crawford. We took away the two greatest things that, that do not allow people to enjoy our sport, which is accessibility and affordability. Whatever we can do to get people on ice, I think it's a, a great activity for kids. It's a great activity for families. And obviously, it's been a great thing for downtown Hartford. Just one requirement, bring your child. And perhaps you should be prepared to learn a few things about them that you might not have known. Many parents are like Nadia Lugo, who brought her son's eight-year-old Nazarius and five-year-old Alexander out for the first time. She had no expectations coming in, but learned her kids have a valuable trait. There you go. Uh, I think resilience. I, th I thought my older one, I thought that he would give up right away, and uh, he's out there doing it. So I think that he's doing great. That must make you proud as a Oh, yes, mom. yes. Don't look down. What's one of the things you remember about your lesson today? How to bend my knees went to, to skate and to keep my leg straight till I'll fall. It's an oft-repeated story here at Bushnell. Many parents beam with pride as their children become more comfortable on the ice and soon develop a passion for skating. In the first session, she was on her own. Like, she could skate, like, on her own. So it was, like, really surprising, and uh, it was a very nice experience. They really enjoy coming. They look forward to it. They ask when we can come out here. My son really couldn't skate well when he first started, and he's doing much better. Now, do you skate? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> There are some things you don't have to be a pro to master, like confidence, determination, pride, and big smiles. Here at Bushnell, there's plenty of those to go around. With your Inside Out Report, I'm Eric Clement. With 45 acres of land here, Wild Bill has plenty of room to expand. In fact, his next project is adding a series of fun houses to the property, one of which used to stand at Staten Island and is being restored right here on site. This place definitely lives up to its name. 
Thanks for joining us. I'm Matt Roberts. We'll see you next week on All Things Connecticut. To see more All Things Connecticut, visit our website at cptv.org. Keywords, All Things Connecticut. Connecticut is a CPTV production made possible with support from People's United Bank, with additional support for the power of giving provided by Newman's Own Foundation.